We're finally day six, Carly Griggs murder trial. And wow, what a ride. We're at the closing arguments. In the prosecution's rebuttal case, we had their last witness was Dr. Pickett. Which, watching this case from beginning to now, he, along with the video footage, was just extraordinarily devastating to the defense. Pickett, if y'all haven't seen Pickett's testimony, you need to go watch it. Really, you need to take the time. It's going to take you a couple of hours to get through it between the prosecution. Well, the prosecution had him on the longest. I mean, the defense only cross-examined him for maybe 30 minutes, 40 tops. It was pathetic. He completely dismantled everything that the defense had the defense's witness, Dr. Clark, is testimony. I mean, bam! Nailed it. Killed it. And uh, Dr. Clark has way more experience. According to the defense. Than Dr. Pickett. So when... <laughs> prosecution had him up. Maybe two hours or so had picket on and it was just I was on the edge of my seat. It was so good. It was so good. And um he answered a lot of my questions and stuff and just uh broke down the video. And I love it when when specialists can break down things cuz I don't always see things. If you guys watch like uh the body language people and they're telling you to look for certain things and it's just incredible, and that's what I, I, I loved about Dr. Pickett. I did not get that from Clark, from the defense's uh, therapist, doctor. Or he's a, a psychiatrist, a forensics guy. So when Pickett was on, oh my God, I... I I'm telling you, you got to go, you got to go watch it. You got to, you just got to, whether watch me cover it or go watch it uninterrupted and just see for yourself. Go watch all the testimony of Dr. Clark and then skip to uh, Dr. Pickett and wow, <laughs> just after each other and watch them and just go and then think for yourself, which one? Do you believe in pretending you're a jury? Because we are really all jurors, right? Watching this and the information we're getting, which could sway us either way, right? Well, the defense gets him. And like I said, it only cross-examined him for, what, 30 minutes or so? Didn't talk about um, her being... Um, diabolical because the way he broke down the video was describing how he felt why she was diabolical why she was not in a detached state why he thinks she was not uh blacked out and the defense just couldn't overcome it couldn't overcome pickett's testimony they didn't they didn't plug away at it to try to break it down. What they did was, is they tried to discredit him. That he didn't, he had only been practicing, well, like he had been fully, uh, got his degree and all this, like maybe two years. But during his residency and all of this stuff, he has, he has a lot of experiences that, but does he have the 30 years or whatever it is Clark has? No, he's a younger man. But he was brilliant, and it was his. And then the defense established that this was Pickett's first time uh, in a trial like this, and I was like, "Damn! If this was his first time, he knocked it out of the park. This guy was incredible. He was. He 
they did not sway him. And then the defense asked him, well, if what if I told you things that could change your mind or something, something to that effect? He said, yeah, if you've got some more evidence that I haven't seen, sure. Which was a dumb question. He's like, sure. He goes, I can only go by what I have, what I observed. Oh, man, it was, it was fabulous. I mean, he Pickett was pointing out that in Dr. Clark's notes, I mean, Pickett had an 85-page, 88-85-page report that he had done evaluating Carly. And he said there were so many... Um, sources he said it was too numerous to keep writing down where he was getting his sources and putting them in his report to show how he's getting to his uh opinion basically he said clark had very little very little and he also had uh i mean i thought it was like a bomb when he said <clears throat> I don't take much stock in what she told Dr. Clark after the murder. I was like, whoa! Whoa! That was huge. And and the defense just couldn't... When, they, when that guy got up to cross-examine Dr. Pickett, it was an epic fail. They didn't hit on any of that stuff. And they knew they probably couldn't, and that's why they didn't. Their 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 tactic was let's try to discredit him. Let's try to say he. Let's show the jury he doesn't have the experience that Dr. Clark has. Oh my God! It just didn't work. Uh, to me, it didn't work. It was just too much. When you have. I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I'm just I'm just on the sidelines viewing this, but I think when you have somebody on that's very likable, they must have felt that he's connecting with the jury, with with the people in the in the room with everybody watching this. He is connecting and what he is saying is devastating. And they just come up and attacked him. I, I just thought it was a bad tactic. Like, they should have went after the meat and potatoes that Pickett served them, <laughs> basically. Like, you should have went after. Well, how come you think? No, because Dr. Clark said she's not diabolical. She's this, she's that. She blacked out. But But they couldn't because there was no evidence prior to the murder that she had all of these problems because she didn't tell nobody. She just tells this to Clark after the murder, which was huge. It, and they couldn't get around it. They they just couldn't attack it in um, when the defense was cross-examining Mr. Dr. Pickett. He said she had executive functions. She was diabolical. She was callous. The defense didn't touch it. They did. They wanted. They also um, went after him on his experience. They went after him on um, on the bio dad. So those are the two main things that stuck out to me. When they were cross-examining him, that they were going after. Like, going after him because he discredited Dr. Harding, because Dr. Harding had diagnosed the bio dad with bipolar. And the whole defense is a big chunk of their case was she inherited this from her dad being bipolar. That this could run in the family. And he was saying that he didn't take basically much stock in what Dr. Hardy said. Because Dr. Hardy had seen him three times, three different occasions, which equal to an hour. And this guy had a history of abusing drugs. And Dr. Hardy, of Mr. Pickett says, and Dr. Hardy 
prescribes him these other drugs that he shouldn't have been on. Because if he was bipolar, he shouldn't be on these drugs, or he shouldn't be because he, these drugs were highly addictive, rather. It's from what my little brain picked up. And what? And so, oh, and also the defense brought up, I guess it's just the three big points. His um, going after the bio dad, how much experience does Mr. Pickett have? And they talked about video games. So the, he brought up a couple of things that were in Carly's diary uh, that he was saying that Carly got from a video game, some phrases or whatever Carly had wrote down, something about the innocence. I should have wrote that down. But her, her screen name was like Slow Assassin or something like that, and they brought up the video game Skyrim. It was pathetic. She, you're trying to say, well, she's mimicking a game, which is possible. I, I get, okay, okay, but still. It was too much of what Pickett had already said in direct with the prosecution that these are the only three topics that they brought up. The bio dead, the, uh, bringing up a video game, her getting some stupid stuff from the video game, and Dr. Pickett's experience. This is what they came after him. On cross, and there was just too much. And they again, this is all they did, and it was only like for 30 40 minutes after he had already been on there a lengthy time with the prosecution and being very thorough. I mean, look, Dr. Clark had me for a minute, okay? She could have all this stuff, okay? Boom, here comes Pickett, just. With the prosecution's questioning to him, just squashing everything, everything, everything. Her not telling nobody prior. She tells Dr. Pickett she's been hearing voices since she was six. I mean, it was just too much. Man. And like I said, he... Um, and if it was his uh, first time up, so, so you're saying this is your first time in this type of case? And he said, yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn. Well, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. And Dr. Pickett also said that uh, he felt she was uh, had traits of narcissistic, narcissist and a psychopath. That's a far cry from, uh, and she had a lack of remorse. And that was a far cry from um, from being a schizophrenic. She had understanding and what she was doing and the nature and quality of what she was doing. Now, here we are. Now, that's a good lowdown of what how we ended on the last witness for this case and now we're in the closing arguments which even in the closing arguments I'm curious to see what the defense is going to say because they did a horrible job with Pickett I think Pickett it's going it to me Pickett in the videos the video of, uh, obviously, the the murder, the video, the 911 call, the video of on the scene, those three things, just has, this case is over for her, to me, because of Pickett, because of Pickett, and because the defense had nothing. It was terrible. I was so disappointed. I was like, okay, I'm excited. The defense is going to get up and cross-examine Dr. Pickett. Let's see what they got. And it was a dumpster fire. It was a dumpster fire. So I, I don't know. Could she get another trial because, because they're incompetence? Because <laughs> it was terrible. <clears throat> Again, though, but 
it was the battle of the experts. Okay, so we had the battle of the experts with the two uh, forensic psychiatrists. But the video, the video uh, is was just too. Oh, and how about the 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 the, the prosecution calling the forensic uh, therapist, psychiatrist, or whatever they are, or whatever. Both of them said the woman in Pickett said they wanted to talk to the dad. And he didn't talk to them. Now, Pickett said he got a call and that he was limited on what he could ask them. And it was like he was limited to like six or eight minutes. And then the prosecution didn't even allude to, well, what y'all talk about? Because I wanted to know what, well, what'd he say? But they didn't even ask. And then when the defense came on, the defense didn't go, well, hey, what did he tell you? Uh, they, nothing. None of that. Because I wanted to hear what, what went on. And then why didn't the dad want to talk, to, the stepdad, talk to them? But I did leave out in my last video, he did talk to, to Clark, the stepdad. But he didn't uh, record it. Clark did not get an audio recording of his meeting, his evaluation with Carly, and his meeting and evaluation with the stepdad. Uh, but, so he meets with them, but he doesn't meet with these other two. Why? Why couldn't he just say the same thing he's telling Dr. Clark? What's going on here? I don't understand it. Now, when I started this, Carly was yucking it up with her grandparents, which, again, is odd and weird. Because, look, they sat through the same case that we just sat through. I didn't come into this case with opinion one way or the other. Now, watching the prosecution's opening statement, I did have the video, and I played it in that video. And I was like, damn. How are they going to, the defense, going to defend this video? What's going on? Is she crazy? Is she some kind of psycho, sociopath, schizophrenic, whatever? Multiple personality. I mean, anything could have came out that something is wrong with her. Clearly, when somebody kills somebody, something's wrong anyway, right? Some, something's wrong, but what is the degree and the level of what's wrong with her? So either she, what, does she need to spend time in prison the rest of her life, or does she need to be in, in some kind of state hospital for the rest of her life, right? So... You know, these were all questions I had in listening to the opening arguments. I was like, whoa. And then when the trial got going, but I think for me, the tipping point was Pickett. C coupled with back at the beginning of the trial, day one, day two, they're playing these videos in its entirety. And that just, to me, that sealed the deal. That she knew what she was doing. She is just a little, maybe you could say she's a spoiled, narcissistic, sociopathic, psychopathic brat. And just wanted to get her mother out of the way because she's pissed at her mother. And this business that she, she got anxiety or she felt detached when her mother yelled at her, which I wasn't buying it. And her her using the word, um, what is this word? Derealization. That had came up. Like, where did she know this word? When she is talking to these other doctors. And what was key, though, what was amazing and stuck out to me is that when it was the defense, I think, that was questioning her, questioning Pickett. And he said, Pickett, I forgot what the question was, but something about what, did he, oh, the defense asked, well, did you talk to her about 
her like blacking out or hearing the whatever, right? Something about her psychosis. He says, no, I didn't ask her about that because I don't want to plant the seed to put things in her head. I want her to give me voluntary information. It was huge. <clears throat> I mean, look. And then he followed up. Pickett followed up by saying, when I go into these state hospitals and talk to these people, he says they are eager at telling him what is wrong with them. They're hearing the voices, and they want him. They beg. He said beg. They beg him to help them make it stop. It was powerful. It was powerful. So Carly... Which, is she malingering is the word they used a lot. Like, And he was saying probably, yeah, basically I'm paraphrasing because she tells Dr. Clark all of this after the murder. All of this comes out. And he was saying he didn't take much stock in it because she has everything to gain, which is her freedom. Okay. Um, this seems kind of lengthy video. Um, I think the jury, they're bringing the jury in, and they had asked to come up and talk to the judge, so I don't know what's going on. I haven't seen this. I haven't seen any of this. All right. I haven't seen the sentencing. I haven't watched it. I want fresh, I want a fresh view on it. So let's, uh, let's see what's going on in the courtroom. Well, they went up to uh, talk to the judge. Well, is that two different grandparents? I mean, who's this guy with the long beard? I don't know. Hmm. A moment ago, y'all, Carly was picking at those things on her face. It was kind of gross. And then the, her, Miss Todd handed her a tissue because I think it, one of them was bleeding. I don't know what's going on with what's around her mouth. And she's uh, been drinking a, a lot of sodas. I just took a Claritin. Hopefully that's going to help. But, uh I have some food allergies, too, and it'll give me congestion if I eat stuff I'm not supposed to be eating. Like, I can't eat a lot of dairy or nuts or this bio crap that's in all the foods. Yeah, it's another fun fact when you get old. <laughs> you can't eat a bunch of stuff you used to eat. Yeah, and I love cheese and I can't have it. But I took a Claritin. Hopefully I, I won't be coughing as much today. I don't know. I mean, how long is this they going to be up there at a sidebar? They were asking for some equipment, so I'm thinking we're going to be, I am thinking that they're going to be showing the video. Man, this is another bomb. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, what are they, I wish we could hear what's going on. I think a lot of that comes out later, that you could get transcripts from the sidebar, maybe. Well, I wish they'd come on. It's kind of a pain to keep fast forward, and then you have to back it up. I don't have precise uh, where to find it. I mean, the, the applications are different from, like, the television, YouTube app, and then from the computer app. I think that my TV YouTube app is... Um, because I could pause it and then go frame by frame. I can't really do that on this, on the computer app. Yeah, it's a pain. 
Wow. I don't know. They're talking about deliberation. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't went further. I've been taking each day. So I don't know. If the, how long did they take to deliberate? I don't know. All right, anything from the state? No, sir. Defense. <coughs> Bring them in. All right, here we go. I'll probably break this up to where we'll just hear the the prosecution's closing, and then I'll do a separate video for the for the defense's closing, so it's not like terribly long. Oh yeah, they got the look. They got the TV facing the jury. They gonna, they gonna show that vid. All right, oh, ladies man. and gentlemen of the jury, did everyone follow the court's instructions overnight? Did anyone allow themselves? Did anyone go do any independent research or allow themselves to be permitted to, to view any uh, news accounts or social media accounts? Anyone fall in that category? Everyone's shaking their head in the negative. I'm about to give you the, the uh, jury instructions done this more times than I can count over the last 20, 25 years of my life. Sometimes I hear these instructions in my sleep, but I couldn't sit down and write them all out for you from scratch, I don't believe. You're going to have the instructions to take back with you. So just sit there and listen. You will have the instructions to take back with you to, to read during your deliberations, okay? All right, members of the jury, you have heard all the testimony and received the evidence in the course of this trial. When you took your places in the courtroom, you made an oath to follow and apply the instructions of the court regarding the law. The court will now instruct you as to the rules of law, which you will use and apply to the evidence in deliberating your verdict. You are not to single out one instruction alone as stating the law, but you must consider these instructions as a whole. Neither are you to be concerned with the wisdom of any rule of law. Regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law ought to be, it would be a violation of your sworn duty to base a verdict upon any other view of the law than that given in these instructions by the court. If in stating the law to you I repeat any rule, direction, or idea, or if I state the same in varying ways, no emphasis is intended, and you must not draw. Let's hold down the talk in the audience. Ooh. If in stating the law to you, I repeat any rule, direction, or idea, or if I state the same in varying ways, no emphasis is intended, and you must not draw any inference therefrom. The order in which these instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. It is your function to determine the facts in this case and to consider, the, and, to consider and weigh the evidence for that purpose. You are to apply the law to the facts and in this way decide the case. The evidence which you are to consider consists of the testimony and statements of the witnesses, any stipulations made by the attorneys, and any exhibits admitted into evidence. You are also permitted to draw such reasonable inferences from the evidence as seem justified in the light of your own experience. It is your prerogative to determine what weight and what credibility will be assigned the testimony and supporting evidence of each witness in this case. You are required and expected to use your good common sense and sound honest judgment in considering and weighing the testimony of each witness who has testified. You should not be influenced by bias, sympathy, or prejudice. Your verdict should be based on the evidence and not upon speculation, guesswork, or conjecture. The production of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. From time to time during the trial, it has been my duty as judge to rule on the admissibility of evidence. You must not concern yourselves with the reasons for the court's rulings, since they are controlled and governed by rules of law. You should not infer from any ruling by the court on these motions or objections to the evidence that the court or the judge has any opinion on the merits favoring one side or the other. You should not speculate as to possible answers to questions which the court did not require to be answered. Further, you should not draw any inference from the content of these questions. You are to disregard all evidence which was excluded by the court from consideration during the course of the trial. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of a crime to be innocent. This presumption places upon the state of Mississippi the burden of proving the defendant guilty of every material element of the crime with which she is charged. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the state must prove that the, def that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is not required to prove her innocence. 
The verdict of the jury must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it will be necessary that each juror agree thereto. In other words, all 12 jurors must agree on any verdict in this case. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate in view of reaching an agreement if you can do so without violence to your individual judgment. Each of you must decide for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberation, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced that it is erroneous, but do not surrender your honest convictions as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning the verdict. The court instructs the jury that the defendant has a constitutional right not to testify at trial. You should not draw any inference from the defendant's failure to testify. The defendant's failure to testify should not in any way be considered by you during the course of your deliberations. The court instructs the jury that you have heard testimony from expert witnesses. Persons who by education and experience have become an expert in some field may state their opinion on matters in that field and may also state their reasons for the opinion. Expert opinion testimony should be judged just like any other testimony. You may accept it or reject it and you may give it as much weight as you think it deserves, considering the witness's education and experience, the reasons given for the opinion, and all other evidence in this case. You are instructed that the indictment creates no inference of guilt, and the fact that the defendant was indicted shall not be considered as evidence against him by the jury, and no inference of guilt can be drawn therefrom. You must not base your verdict solely, upon, solely on the number of witnesses for either party. The defendant. Carly Madison Gregg has been charged by indictment in count one with the crime of first degree murder, in count two with the crime of attempted murder, and in count three with the crime of tampering with physical evidence. Count one. The court instructs the jury that the defendant Carly Madison Gregg has been charged in the indictment with the crime of first degree murder. You find from the evidence in this case beyond a reasonable doubt that on about the 19th day of March, not of March 2024 in Rankin County, Mississippi, the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, did willfully, feloniously, and without authority of law kill and murder Ashley Smiley, a human being. With deliberate design to effect the death of Ashley Smiley, then you shall find the defendant guilty as charged in count one. If the state has failed to prove any one or more of the above listed elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall find the defendant not guilty as charged in count one of the indictment. The court instructs the jury that the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, has been charged in the indictment with the crime of attempted murder. If you find from the evidence in this case beyond a reasonable doubt that on about the 19th day of March 2024 in Rankin County, Mississippi, the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, did willfully, unlawfully, and feloniously attempt to kill Heath Smiley, a human being, but failed to complete the act, then you shall find the defendant guilty as charged in count two. If the state has failed to prove any one or more of the above listed elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall find the defendant not guilty as charged in count two of the indictment. Count three, the court instructs the, def the, the jury that the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, has been charged in the indictment with the crime of tampering with physical evidence. If you find from the evidence in this case beyond a reasonable doubt that on about the 19th day of March 2024 in Rankin County, Mississippi, the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, did willfully, unlawfully, and feloniously intentionally destroy, mutilate, conceal, remove, or alter physical evidence with intent to impair its use, verity, or availability in the pending criminal investigation or prospective official proceeding, then you shall find the defendant guilty as charged in count three. If the state has failed to prove any one or more of the above listed elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall find the defendant not guilty as charged in count three of the indictment. The court instructs the jury that there is a presumption that an accused is sane, and therefore the burden is initially on the accused to introduce evidence which creates a reasonable doubt as to her sanity at the time of the act. However, once the defendant has created a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's sanity, it is the burden of the state to, prove, to present sufficient evidence to prove the defendant's sanity beyond a reasonable doubt. The court instructs the jury that the following is the definition of insanity in Mississippi. Insanity exists when at the time of committing the act, the accused was laboring under such defect of reason from disease of mind as one, to not know the nature and quality of the act she was doing, or two, if she did know the nature and quality of the act, she did not know that what she was doing was wrong. 
court instructs the jury that if you find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt all the essential elements of count one, first degree murder, count two, attempted murder, and count three, tempering with physical evidence, then you must find the defendant guilty of count one, first degree murder, count two, attempted murder, and count three, tempering tampering with physical evidence, unless the state of Mississippi has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was sane at the time the defendant committed the crimes of count one, first degree murder, count two, attempted murder, and count three, tampering with physical evidence. In order to prove the defendant was the defendant saying that the commission of the crimes of count one, first degree murder, count two, attempted murder, and count three, tampering with physical evidence, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that at the time of the commission of the crimes of count one, first degree murder, count two, attempted murder, and count three, tampering with physical evidence, the defendant had the mental capacity to realize and appreciate the nature and quality of her acts and to distinguish between right and wrong with reference to the acts she committed. If after considering all of the evidence in this case, you find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was sane at the time of the commission of the crimes and count one first degree murder, count two attempted murder, and count three tampering with physical evidence, then your verdict must be not guilty by reason of insanity. The court instructs the jury that if you find that the defendant, when sober, is capable of distinguishing between right and wrong and the defendant voluntarily deprives herself of the ability to distinguish between right and wrong by reason of becoming intoxicated and commits an offense while in that condition, she is criminally responsible for such acts. The court instructs the jury that when all 12 of you reach and agree upon a verdict as to the indictment, you shall return the verdict to the court in one of the following forms. Count one. Should you find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, We, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity, then state your verdict in one of the following forms. Quote, We, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that the defendant has since been restored to reason. Close quote. R. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that she has not been restored to her reason and is a danger to the community. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty of first-degree murder, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty of first-degree murder. Close quotes. Count two. Should you find the defendant guilty of attempted murder as charged in the indictment, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of attempted murder as charged in the indictment. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity, then state your verdict in one of the following forms. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that the defendant has since been restored to reason. Close quotes. R. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that she has not been restored to her reason and is a danger to the community. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty of attempted murder, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty of attempted murder. Count three. Should you find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in the indictment, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in the indictment. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity, then state your verdict in one of the following forms. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that the defendant has since been restored to reason. Close quotes. R. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, not guilty by reason of insanity, and we find that she has not been restored to her reason and is a danger to the community. Close quotes. Should you find the defendant not guilty of tampering with evidence, then state your verdict as follows. Quote, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty of tampering with evidence. Close quotes. Write your verdicts on a clean, separate sheet of paper. It is not necessary that you sign the verdicts. Counsel for both, for both sides will now have an opportunity to address you and make their closing or final arguments. The arguments, statements, and remarks of counsel are intended to help you understand the evidence and apply the law, but they are not evidence. The attorneys in making these arguments to you will be commenting upon the testimony that you have heard and the evidence that has been presented in this case. They, as you, will be recalling the evidence that has been presented. They should not intentionally try to mislead you. However, if their recollection of the evidence differs from what your recollection is, you must follow your own recollection. If any argument, statement, or remark has no basis in the evidence, 
then you should disregard that argument, statement, or remark. Jury instructions will be on the bench in front of the court. If either side needs them, you can come get them. If you use them, return them in the same order you picked them up in. Closing arguments on behalf of the state. Mr. Shipley, you'll keep time. Hey, please. Those were pretty thorough instructions. I I thought it was interesting and relevant to hear that. So this video is going to be a little long. They have 40 minutes to do their the, the closing. Each of them, what they uh, on day uh, day four, they agreed on 40 minutes apiece. So we're getting right into the. Prosecution. Here we go. The court. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Miss Todd stood before you on Monday in her opening statement and told you, this is not a case about who did it. And in fact, all of the evidence that you've seen tells you exactly that. It's not a case about who did it. You haven't seen one shred of evidence in this case that what happened on March 19, 2024, was caused by anyone other than Carly Madison Gray. The defense also told you during opening statements on Monday that the state wants you to leave your common sense at the door. That they want you to tie it up in a bucket and leave it at the door. Ladies and gentlemen, all we want you to do in this case is use your common sense. And in fact, that's what Judge Arthur just instructed you to do in the very first jury instruction. And I want to talk about a few of these jury instructions um, with you real quick. But in jury instruction number one, which you'll have back in the room with you, on the second page he instructs you, you're required and expected to use your good common sense and sound honest judgment in considering and weighing the testimony of each witness who has testified. You should not be influenced by bias, sympathy, or prejudice. Your verdict should be based on the evidence and not upon speculation, guesswork, or conjecture. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the state, all we want you to do is to go back there and use your good common sense and your sound, honest judgment. And again, I don't believe that you've heard one shred of evidence throughout this entire week that the person who shot Ashley Smiley was in fact Carly Madison Gregg. The person who shot and attempted to kill Heath Smiley was Carly Madison Gregg. And the person who took down the camera from the kitchen and hid it in the refrigerator behind some water bottles was Carly Madison Gregg. Now, Judge Arthur also read you um, the elements of the crimes. Uh, and again, you'll have this information back there with you in the jury instructions. It's jury instruction number eight. And I kind of want to go down um, because as a, as a simple person myself, uh, you know, I like to kind of have a road map as to where I'm going. Um, you know, so I like to be able to look at things and see them on paper, and that's exactly what these jury instructions provide you, kind of a road map to help guide you in your deliberations. So I want to talk about count one, which is the first degree murder. And there's three elements here that it has listed. And the very first one says that on about the 19th day of March, 2024, in Rankin County, Mississippi. That's the first thing you have to find. Ladies and gentlemen, all the testimony has been that this happened on March 19th, 2024. You heard from uh, Deputy Hunter Lewis, who was the, the first deputy who arrived on the scene there, that he was called out that day, that he received a call from dispatch um, to respond to 214 Ashton Way, which is in the Farmington Station subdivision off of um, Old Fannin Road. Uh, and you heard um, the Mr. Kevin Collins, the 911 dispatcher, who told you that the call out came on that day uh, at that time, about five o'clock in the afternoon, and you heard them tell you that obviously Farmington Station is in, located in Rankin County, Mississippi. So there's no question as to, as to that first part of the element there. Um, as to number two, that the defendant Carly Madison Gregg did willfully, feloniously, and without authority of law kill and murder uh, Ashley Smiley, a human being. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard from Mr. Cliff Dunlap, the, um, the deputy coroner, who told you that the manner and cause of death in this case was found to be uh, three gunshot wounds to the head, and that it was found to be homicide, and that the victim was indeed identified as uh, Miss Ashley Smiley. The last part there is that she did it with deliberate design to affect the death of Ashley Smiley, the victim. Ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that in the state of Mississippi, when it talks about deliberate design, that it's simply talking about an intent to kill. An intent to kill the victim, Ashley Smiley. That she did this with an intent to kill. And I would further submit to you that the use of a deadly weapon is an intent to kill. Whenever you aim a deadly weapon, a pistol, a 357 revolver at someone's head and you shoot three times, that's certainly an intent to kill. Now, again, it's, it's not a case about who did it. Let's, let you, and, and I'll show you some of the video here in just a second. Um, but let's think about what happened that day. So you remember from the video, you saw from the garage, you heard several witnesses talk about it, that uh, earlier that day, uh, Mr. Bennett Germany and another friend, Sarah Catherine Rayleigh, who, uh, who the defense put on the stand yesterday, uh, you heard from them and they said they devised this plan to go talk to Ashley, to go talk to Carly's mom because they were worried about Carly. They were good friends, they were worried about Carly, and they were worried about her drug use, her use of burner phones, and I just want to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a case about marijuana and whether or not she was smoking marijuana. This is a case about whether or not she was intoxicated, voluntary intoxicated. You heard me talk to Dr. Clark about that, that she would, one of these times that she says she has one of these events where she supposedly zoned out. That in fact, what happened was, was that she went and smoked marijuana. It could have been any drug, but it was just marijuana. And she zoned out and she had this event where supposedly she says that she, you know, fell out on the floor and, and whatever happened. And she did that after her mom and Heath left um, one day and went to the grocery store. But I just want to be clear, it's not a case about marijuana. Um, it's simply a case about, you know, her actions. And so, um, Car uh, Bennett and Sarah Catherine, they devised this plan. They're going to tell Miss Smiley. Well, obviously, you heard testimony that one of the things that Miss Smiley was worried about was her daughter, Carly, the love of her life. You heard that she had another daughter who died at a very young age from, from some type of genetic uh, disorder that she had. So you've got Carly here. She's the love of, of, of Ashley's life. Obviously, she's disappointed, probably a little bit sad, probably worried for her daughter. And the last thing that she wants her to do, according to the defense, is turn into her dad, right? Her biological dad, who you've heard about, who obviously liked to use a lot of drugs, abuse a lot of drugs. So at some point, she confronts Carly. She searches her backpack, whether in the car, on the ride home, or at the school, and then you see them get home, and you heard Dr. Pickett talk about it yesterday, that the situation seemed a little bit tense, right? That they get out of the car in their garage, you don't hear, they're not talking to each other, and they go in, you see Ashley put her coat and her phone down on the bar there in the kitchen, and she proceeds directly uh, to the side of the house where Carly's room is located, presumably to start searching through Carly's room, right? And so you see Carly kind of walk back and forth. You see her walk there to the living room area and kind of listen to see what her mom's doing. At some point, she eventually takes the dogs out, right? I don't know what happened while she was outside, ladies and gentlemen, but at some point whenever she was outside, she made up her mind, if not long before, We'll talk about that in a second, her, her conversations with, with uh, her friend from MSMS, Thad, that you heard from. But at some point outside, she makes up her mind exactly what she's going to do. And she comes back in from taking out the dogs. She walks there to that living room area, kind of listens to see if her mom's still in her room. And then without hesitation, she walks, as Dr. Pickett said, to the side of the house, her mom and, and Heath's bedroom, where this pistol is located. She knows it's located there. Now, they want you to believe that from the time she brought the dogs back in or took the dogs out, that she blacked out at that point. 
You heard me ask Dr. Clark. Well, from the time she took out the dogs to the time she was arrested by Deputy Shaq, who you also heard from, that she was blacked out in that period. Well, that's a real convenient time to be blacked out, right? And so she, she brings the dogs back in, and she goes directly to her, to her mom's room and, and Heath's room, and she retrieves this pistol. And you see her walk back across the screen. Well, when she gets there, she looks around the corner into the kitchen to make sure that her mom hasn't come out of her room, knowing exactly what she's doing. Cool, calm, calculated, and callous. She walks directly, she proceeds to her room, and a couple seconds later, you hear the shots. Boom, boom. You hear two shots within three seconds of each other. You've seen the pictures. You heard Dr. Pickett testify yesterday. Two well-placed shots right to the side of, of Miss Smiley's head, a relatively small target. And then a couple seconds later, boom, you hear a third shot right under the chin. And we believe it's right under the chin. It's the third shot. We know it's right under the chin. We believe it's the third shot. You heard uh, De uh, Deputy Investigator Burnell tell you, talk about the stippling, the powder burn around the shot, right? And he tells you that based off his training and experience that that shot had to be within 36 inches because that's when you see stippling. The powder that comes out that, that's still ignited, that doesn't have time to burn, and it burns right here on Miss Smiley's uh, face. And then what does she do? Immediately, you'll see on the video that happens at 4.14, 4.14 p.m. Immediately she comes back in, she gets on her mom's phone, she has the wherewithal to enter her mom's code onto her phone and to text someone specific. And that someone specific was her stepdad, he's Smiley. And you'll see that that text message was sent at the same, within the same minute, 414, that she shot and killed her mom. And what did she say to him? Something to the effect of, when are you gonna be home, honey? And it's perfect grammar. The comma's in the right place, right before honey, right? She knows exactly what she's doing. She comes in there, she knows exactly where the camera is. She comes, she's got the gun hid behind her, hidden behind her. She slides down into the chair and you hear her put it down on the bar stool. You can hear, it whenever you get back to the jury room, you'll be able to hear that. She puts it down. You hear Dr. Pickett talk about, she's got the wherewithal to know exactly where the dogs are. The dog walks behind her, you'll see him. He walks behind her and she knows to, oh, let me make sure he doesn't knock the gun off, right? At some point, she begins text messaging her friend. She shoots her mom at 414. Then she inv invites her friend from school, who you heard from, Brooke. She invites Brooke over. You'll see the messages between her and Brooke. They're in evidence. And you'll see where Brooke texts her at 458, basically 40 minutes later, 45 minutes later, and says, I'm here. Brooke had no clue what she was about to walk into. Carly meets her at, at the door, says something to the effect of, have you ever seen, a, or, or are you squeamish of dead bodies? Well, Brooke says, I don't know. I've never seen a dead body. Not thinking that there's a dead body currently in the house, right? Carly's walking around with the gun. Carly leads her back to the room and shows her her dead mom who's got her arms crossed over, who's been, who's been posed, right? She, she, she's posed her mom at this point. She's put her arms across her. She's put a red towel over her face. Again, cool, calm, and calculated. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew exactly who to reach out to during this time. She's reaching out to all of her friends. You heard from multiple friends that she reached out to. You heard from her friend, Thad, um, who she was texting. And, it, and, and actually before they text, she calls him on FaceTime. And what does, she, what does she tell him? Well, she tells him, and excuse my language, I fucked up, right? Well, how do you know you messed up if you don't know what you did? She knew what she did. She knew the difference between right and wrong. So she obviously tells Thad, but she can't tell him what she did. 
She knows she can't tell him over the phone. Well, then being a good friend and being worried, Thad begins to text her after they get off the phone. And he, you know, they're messaging. Well, of course, in the meantime, she's walking back and forth in and out of, of, her, of her room where her mom's located. She's walking back and forth. Um, she's sending messages to multiple other friends um, and dad is messaging her but she, he can't get a response and he says I'm worried about you if, if I don't hear from you I'm going to call 911 and she says you can't do that why? why can't you call 911? because she knows what she did was wrong and she doesn't want 911 over there because she's about to try to kill Heath and she doesn't want 911 over there because it's going to ruin her plan. Damn. Right? Knowing the difference between right and wrong. And you heard me. I very specifically asked Dr. Clark. You render the opinion that she could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong. Right? Well, you heard Dr. Pickett and Dr. Gugliano testify yesterday. That's not the standard in Mississippi. In fact, there's, a, there's an instruction in here that defines, it's jury instruction number 10, that defines exactly what insanity is. And it goes on down there, and it says that the accused was laboring under such defective reason from disease of mind as to not know the nature and quality of the act she was doing, or two, if she did know the nature and quality of the act she was doing, she did not know what she was doing was wrong. It's not appreciate. The standard in Mississippi is not that you appreciate the difference between right and wrong. She knew what she was doing was wrong. Look at all of her actions. Sneaking around the house. Calling over the friends. Knowing not to tell the friends over the phone what she did. SK, SK that, they, that they called in yesterday, her friend. You know, what, what does she say? Dr. Pickett talked about it. Well, she says... Uh, I'll tell you tomorrow if I see you. Well, why would I not see you tomorrow? Well, because I'm going to be in jail probably. Right? She knew what she did was wrong. She tells her friend, Brooke, whenever Brooke comes over, she says, I put... Three in my mom, and I've got three more in here for Heath whenever he gets home. Right? I'm going to take care of him. Three more what? Three more bullets in the gun. She texted her friend, Bennett, tried to call him, did call him, text him. And he tells her, of course, again, he's a good friend too. He's worried about her. Same one that told her mom what had been going on, that he was worried about her trying to do the right thing. He tells her, don't hurt yourself or anyone else. Don't harm yourself or anyone else. What does she say? Too late. Again, knowing the difference between right and wrong. You saw the video from Deputy Shaq, and they want you to believe that he did something wrong because he muted his body cam or whatever he did. He told you that whenever he got Carly out of the back of his car and the other deputy started performing the GSR test on Carly's hands, which you saw them doing there, being as nice as all get out to her, right? Baby, I'm, you know, are you okay? You heard him say that, that his involvement in the case was over. He never went in the house. He didn't transport her to jail or anywhere else. They want you to believe that him muting the body cam was him doing something wrong. He told you that his involvement was done and over at that time. Now, I want to play just a short clip of the video for you before my time's up.
This video evidence is just unbelievable. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt that Carly Madison Gregg is the one who killed her mom, Ashley Smiley. There's no doubt that she attempted to kill he Smiley when she aimed the gun right at his head and shot and hit him in the shoulder. And there's no doubt that she's the one who hid the camera, thus tampering with evidence in the refrigerator. And we would ask you that you go back there and you find her guilty of all three because she was not insane at the time that this happened. She knew exactly what she was doing and she knew the difference between right and wrong. All right, closing by the defense. All right, I'm gonna stop it right there. Um, You know, I want to see fire out of a prosecution. She did okay. But I want to see fire and passion. We all like that. Hammering at home. Just the emotional ride with it. But could he have done a better job? Yeah, but he... I think he should have went more on um, Dr. Pickett when he was playing that video. Before, before he played the video, he should have said, Remember when Dr. Pickett broke it down for us? Why she's diabolical. Why she was callous. It's because she was making specific executive... What, what is it? Executive functions. Dr. Pickett used those terms. I mean, I was think I was hoping he would, because that's huge. <clears throat> to me, it was Pickett in the videos that sealed the deal for this case, and to just hammer it home. Maybe he didn't need to. I don't know. Maybe you know, but I don't know. I I I was expecting him to start saying things like that. Remember Pickett's testimony. Remember how Pickett broke down the video for you. Watching her calculated moves. Her going to get specific objects in the house. How can you be detached? Or looking at your body. You're hovering and watching yourself. Or, or she's blacked out. But she is doing specific 
executive functions that her mind knows where things are. She is doing calculative things. I, I wanted him to just really hone in on that. I, I, I really did because those are the things that just honed in on me. But that's just me personally. But we're going to wrap this up. Uh, this is a, a little bit lengthy video, and we'll pick back up on the defense's closing arguments in the next video. There you go.